leftist, brilliant Marxists, even even the most brilliant Marxist analysts, right, often kind of miss the boat on exactly when uh, the collapse is coming and exactly when the revolution is coming. We're kind of famous for that, mostly because we're the ones who are always talking about it, but also because it's very tricky. Um, and my favorite quote about that comes from CLR James, actually, um, talking about the death of Walter Rodney, and he's talking about Lenin um, as he's doing that. And he says, um, he's in fact lecturing Walter Rodney, who is dead, about uh, getting better strategic politics, and he's lecturing all of us about it too. Um, and he says, uh, he's really bad, he's really bad that, the, that he died. And I, I, totally, I totally believe that. But he says, um, we gotta think about taking power. And he says, note, uh, in Lenin's lecture on the 1905 revolution, which was given on 22 January 1917, memorable year, uh, he said, Lenin said, we of the older generation may not live to see the decisive battles of this coming revolution. Note that, for Lenin then it's a long way out, but I can, I believe, express the confident hope that the youth, which is working so splendidly in the socialist movement of Switzerland and the whole world, uh, will be fortunate enough not only to fight, but also to win the coming proletarian revolution. That was Lenin in 1917. Okay, so that's the great assault for all of our predictions, but it's also, I think, a very hopeful message, which is to say, um, well, they did still fuck shit up. Lenin could be that wrong, and the revolution happened uh, not very quickly, not very long after that. Um, I got some other quotes, in fact, uh, that uh, I think might add to this. Um, this one's also from, this one's from Lenin in his own words, which he says, democracy is the form of the state. It represents on the one hand, organized sy sy systematic use of force against persons. But on the other hand, it signifies the formal recognition of equality of citizens, the equal right of all to determine the structure of and administer the state. Now, there's a lot of problems with that definition, but I think it captures something that came out in both of your talks, which is the simultaneity, right, of the, the undemocracy of democracy, right? And the sort of democratic uh, aspiration, the democratic declaration of democracy, right? It's the, the carrot and the stick, the what we say, what we do, that's always going on in the form of capitalist democracy, right? That is really the sediment of past victories of the working class. Like we wouldn't have elections, right? If the working class hadn't been constantly threatening to overthrow the ruling class, right? And that's what elections are. That's what they represent. That contradiction is embedded in them. My last quote, sorry for all the quotes, but I, I do I love them. Um, this one's from Abraham Lincoln, right? Who notably uh, was present and became a quote unquote great man at this moment, another moment of crisis, right? In capitalism for the world and in uh, democracy for the United States of America. And he says, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty and we must rise to the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew and boy did he. Um, we must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. And I think it's a very good quote uh, right up until the end uh, where it's talking about our country. I don't want to save this country uh, or really any country, right? We want to save humanity. We want to save the planet. We want to save the possibility of living human life. Okay, so the question I'm supposed to answer with all that shit is uh, how close are we to fascism? Um, and uh, what's happening? What time is it? And... Uh, the bad news is, I think uh, it's already happening. It's already well underway. Uh, we're in it. It's not just a crisis. We're in a moment of collapse. And I think that for a few reasons, um, particularly uh, because I think we need to kind of abandon this looking at the question of democracy as a matter of snapshots, as a matter of like specific markers, like are we still having elections? Are we still doing this? Are we still doing that? I think we need to look at the whole snapshot, right? And we need to not look at the Republican Party over here and the Democratic Party over here. I think we need to look at the way that they are working together and the way that that has produced not just a crisis, but a spiral uh, toward, toward a very serious collapse that we are in, right? Um, and for me, I want to, what I want to describe is the process of the way those things work together um, so that hopefully we can all be looking at it from that lens of that big picture with the little nodes of how things are progressing, or not the little notes, they're all very big, important markers, but um, uh, I don't, I, for example, I wanna say, let's not think about when are we gonna stop having elections. Right, right now we don't have elections that mean shit already, that's true, but also like, I don't think it's clear uh, how and if and when that would happen, and by the time it does happen, it will be too late to be too worried about that, right? Uh, might already be too late to be too worried about that. So where I wanna start with how I see this process moving is with this concept of a crisis of social reproduction. And David mentioned this a little bit. 
Um, social reproduction, weird fuzzy concept, uh, but I want to use it in the following way. Social reproduction is the reproduction of capitalism as such, right? It's the reproduction of the ruling class and the power of the ruling class to organize the economy and social life, right? So social reproduction often can be a quite re repressive matter, right? Um, you can look at any given piece of the puzzle of social reproduction and it has for a very long time been organized such that it reproduces capitalism in that sense, right? So when you go to school, you learn how to answer to a bell, right? You learn how to answer to a bell, the bell's the same bell that was in a factory, right, that tells you when to clock in and clock out, right? So that's a, that's a good example of the social reproduction of capitalism as such. But in order to reproduce uh, capitalism as such, social reproduction is also about reproducing the working class, right? And reproducing the working class as a social unit, right? So now we're talking about what's going on in the kitchen in this, uh, in this building, what's going on in the kitchen in your house, right? On a very simple, basic level, right? A lot, a lot of that kind of social reproduction is unpaid. Not all of it is, right? The same thing happens in schools. Teachers are, yes, uh, working toward uh, helping discipline children for the workforce, but they're also educating children, right? And it depends on the teacher, depends on the school, but this, that contradiction exists in the process of social reproduction for pay and in the process of social reproduction uh, not for pay at home, right? We're both producing people to be functional in capitalism and we're reproducing them as people, right? Because we can't be functional in capitalism unless we have that kind of core element of our creativity, our humanity, our brilliant intellects. Capitalism needs all that, right? To extract our surplus value. And that's what social reproduction does. So when we say there's a crisis of social reproduction, oh, the third level is reproducing ourselves as individuals. Another thing we're doing right now, right here, right? Another thing that's happening over here. How do we educate at a very individual level? How do we reproduce each other emotionally, socially, right? This is crucially important, and it's going to come back in my what is to be done. So at those three levels, I think we can really see that there is not just, there's no longer just a crisis of social reproduction, the way that I've been personally talking about for about 15 years here. Um, but actually a, a beginning of a real uh, uh, collapse, a beginning of a real um, non-reproduction of reproduction, right? Uh, at a global scale, uh, and it's happening at both the levels of the reproduction of, of the capitalist class, right? Um, and we can see that, right, when you order, on, you order something on Amazon and it's not going to be here for three and a half weeks, right? Because it's just chaos out there. And, and what used to be this very... Uh, snappily organized like just-in-time logistics production is now like it, it's like trying to it looks like it makes putting kindergartners in line in class look like an efficient smooth sailing process right um it's not working very well right and we're starting to see the culmination especially in certain sectors right of this ongoing crisis of the rate of profitability, right? So it's starting to become hard just to simply hit the working class enough to extract enough surplus value to produce enough profit to increase, to keep that rate of profit going up. That's a problem. So even though the ruling class is getting very wealthy, they are losing power in a certain sense, right? And that's related too, right? Where you start to see the value of money being uh, sort of deranged, right? Because that money is not expressing a, a, a consistent, equal um, and coherent uh, degree of social power. Right? That's part of what that kind of instability comes from. But then also at the level of reproducing the working class as a social unit, we're obviously in collapse. We're obviously in crisis, right? We have a pandemic that is ongoing, that has taken out millions of people around the world totally needlessly, right? We have emerging pandemics. That's before and besides we get to um, all of the other elements here. We're talking about declining uh, uh, rates of life expectancy, declining life expectancy uh, in what used to be called or what we might still call the first world or the metropole, right? That's been ongoing for some time. It's like hitting a, it's, the gas is hitting, is, is really getting hit on that. And it's very class divided, right? It's, that's even more apparent if you start looking at those statistics along lines of class, along lines of race. Um, it's, it's quite dramatic. And what it reminds me most of is uh, specific instances of that that we've seen in the last century in, in Somebody mentioned capital strike yesterday, but particularly in places where capital strike happened, you start seeing this huge decline in life expectancy. Zimbabwe is one example, but there's a few other ones. That's happening kind of at a global scale right now, kind of, especially in um, places that have never had any kind of uh, really, um, nothing to call social democracy worth the name, um, like here. So, okay, that's what I think is happening in terms of where are we in the crisis of social reproduction, the collapse of social reproduction. We're in it. That's what's happening. We're doing it. Okay. Um, 
And I want to think about how that process works because I think that's clarifying for the what is to be done. So I want to go back a little bit and say my research and a lot of my political activity has uh, been about attending to um, social re social, socially reproductive care, both for pay and not pay, uh, and specifically in a lot of cases nurses and teachers. Well, this has been a site that's quite interesting. Um, during the pandemic here in the US. But prior to that, I was looking at those same groups of folks in South Africa during the HIV and AIDS pandemic. And um, if the, the, the process repeats itself on a grander and grander scale is one of the things that I would say. And so I think they're very useful also for looking at the question of how do we think about this reformation of the Republican Party? How do we think about these new open calls for jackbooted thugs? How do we think about the, this whole new uh, public uh, declarations of overt white supremacy coming out of this crowd, right, as a, as a definite shift, right, in the way that we've been talking about it. Um, but how does that relate to uh, what's happening in the Democratic Party and what we see going on there? Because on a certain level, um, the uh, components of what might be historically thought of as a definition of fascism exist um, in both, are, are, are best operated by both by each, by different parties, right? And when they come together, um, or when they're apparently in conflict, they're producing the increasing um, degrees of living in fascism. Um, and I think for me, the um, teachers are a really useful way of thinking about that uh, because on the one hand, um, we, the teacher strikes in West Virginia uh, a few years back, I'm so old. I can't even remember how many years things are. About five, four or five years ago, um, we started seeing this. We saw a statewide strike in West Virginia, right? That inspired teachers across the country to start going on strike. Um, that was eventually uh, kind of denuded and de defanged exactly in the way that these uh, gentlemen described, right? Specifically by the Democratic Party and the attachment of the union bureaucracy to the Democratic Party. Um, and you could see the change as it happened in West Virginia. The teachers had their own shirts and they had their own. Uh, posters and they had their own politics, right? And by the time you got to Oklahoma and the strike failed, the teachers were all wearing the same matching t-shirt shipped in by the AFT International, by uh, my union president. Um, and it didn't, one strike won, one strike didn't, pretty simple. Um, but we start to see, right, this increasing militancy in teachers when the pandemic hit. Who are the people that in fact organized at all, right, to keep us from having to go to work and get COVID and die? It was parents keeping their kids home and it was teachers uh, shutting down schools, just like they had done in the strike. What was Biden's first agenda item when he got back into office, right? Everybody thought Biden is going to solve this pandemic. No, Biden did, and only Biden could do. Trump could not do this, right? Biden got up and said, we're going to reopen the schools. That's my first line of action. And that's what happened. That's why we're still in this pandemic, right? That's why we're still in this pandemic. Um, only Biden can do that. That's why nobody's talking about the fact that we're still in this pandemic, right? That's why there's a, there's a big lie that it's over, right? Um, Trump alone could not functionally produce that, right? We see this on a whole bunch of different levels. The same thing I suspect will be true with elections, right? That on the one hand, you're going to have these uh, fascist clowns, right? And fascists are always clowns, get up and say that we don't want to have elections. And on the other hand, we're going to have Biden or some other hack like Biden get up and say, um, we're going to defend democracy and make sure there are elections against these fascist clowns. And in order to do that, we're going to send in the military, the border patrol. In fact, the fascists are attacking our election sites. We're going to go in with the military and the border patrol and shut down the election sites to make sure that the fascists don't win, right? And that we protect our democratic equality that exists under the rule of the Democratic Party in a single party state without elections, right? And you can see somebody, oh, it was, was Searsha, she's not here. Anyway, blew my mind yesterday by referring to New York State as benefiting from the concept of states' rights. And I was like, the Democratic Party is a states' rights, states rights party, and the Republican Party is a states' rights party. And that's true at the level of the state, right? You get to keep these, you get to keep these, and it's true at the level of those little gerrymandered districts we have in every state, right, that are gerrymandered specifically around where do the black folks live, where do the queer people live, right, to make sure that we don't get votes, right? That's always been true, it's more true now, and they are really leaning into it. So anyway, that's how I see the process of this happening. I have a few other things I want to say. Um, how much time do I have, by the way? You just ran out, but... I just ran out. Okay, so let me, let me conclude. I really, I agreed also with the hint of a conclusion that um, y'all started talking about, and uh, I um, 
I've been thinking about this a lot, right? Because on the one hand, uh, I was going to go into a section about what resources do we have? Well, we have all these moments where these huge uprisings have kicked off. For me, it's very inspiring. But on the other hand, we keep losing, right? And I'm not, we don't know when the next one's going to happen or how big it's going to be. But what we do have is everybody who's radicalized in those moments, right? We have everybody who learned lessons, who experienced those moments. It is our job to find those people. And when we say organize them, that doesn't mean get them to sign a membership card for whatever the fuck it is that we're getting. I mean, I'm all for that, but that's not step one. Step one is that level of individual, one-on-one, -on -one, human social reproduction. We need to know people. We need to trust people, right? If you can't trust people to be fair in a meeting, right, that is not somebody you can trust to be hiding out in the swamp with you and your little maroon community while we're regrouping and reforming, you know, uh, the self-defense and social reproduction that we need to live and survive. And let me cut to the chase and say that's what we're doing. That's what we need to be doing. That's what we're doing here, right? And if we're talking about references to history, I'm trying to point some direction that I think many of y'all will be familiar with. I recently changed my name by one letter my, uh, for a bunch of reasons, but one of them is um, that uh, my new name means from the swamp, a thing which is true of me, um, from Houston, Texas. And I've often said throughout the course of my life, it's like a little meism that, you know, when we're in the swamp, we gotta like get out. You don't have to worry about how you got in, you need to worry about how you get out. But recently I've been reevaluating that and saying, no, I think we need to be in the swamp. The swamp is good. The swamp is a beautiful, fertile place that is protected, that is, uh, you know, diverse uh, uh, in, in its biology, that produces unexpected and unknown things, and where they can't find you until you're ready, right? Uh, where you're coming out to find them, okay? And so right now we're in the swamp and that's where we need to be is uh, the conclusion of that. And if you're not in your swamp with your closest and bestest comrades or the people you think should be your closest and bestest comrades, that's where you should head because you might find those people there, okay? Um, and that's what we're trying to do uh, in our little neck of the rabbit swamp um, uh, down south of here. And uh, I look forward to um, meeting y'all in the great emergence once again.